So you're better off going a little bit higher and, you know, avoiding that, that hard shot. I mean, I've hard shot animals before and it rarely has the effect that you would think. You'd think they're going to drop instantly and they're just dead, right? Well, that, that's usually not what happens. Um, so we're looking at this from a, like I said, an insurance standpoint, we're looking for forgiveness because everything doesn't always go the way you want it to, you know, like I said, shit happens. I mean, you just, you have to look at this from a, things aren't going to go the textbook way you think they're going to go. You know, something's going to go wrong. So you want to put yourself in a position where you can likely retrieve the animal if the bullet doesn't hit exactly where you want it. Or, you know, maybe the animal turns slightly one way or the other and you have to go through more more uh, mass and more animal than you thought you were going to before you hit anything important. You want that deep penetration. Hey guys, this is Tim with Little Crow Gunworks. Welcome back to the channel. Uh, today we are going to do a video on or talk about um, terminal performance, bullet construction, uh, and hit probabilities, and how they're related and why that stuff all matters. Now, um, I apologize for how long it's taken me to get to this video. We've been working on other stuff, trying to get uh, the 22 Nosler finished product rifle videos done and we've been working on getting everything lined up. We're getting uh, our trimmers into all of the shield stores nationwide. So I've been working on getting that uh, figured out and getting set up with them. And um, the orders are coming in now, so you guys will see our trimmers in their stores uh, over the next month or so here. So it's taken me a little while to get to this, but I'm hoping now that that's behind me, I'll be able to get to these videos uh, a little quicker and increase the the cadence at which they're coming out so you guys aren't waiting so long for each one and also we got uh, two feet of snow here which kind of limited my ability to get out and do any testing um, but now the weather's starting to turn so hopefully i can get out and uh, increase the cadence on these things and get you guys some actual uh, guns in these videos but anyway um after going through the comments of that last video the the response has been overwhelmingly positive. Um, we've had next to zero troll activity. So that's been uh, really nice. Um, so thank you guys for, for what you are contributing in the comments that you're leaving. And um, I think we have some good discussions going in those comments. And um, I wanted to take a minute to thank you guys for your support. So today we are going to start by talking about uh, terminal performance and bullet construction and further support why we chose the CX and why that's relevant. And then look at hit probabilities and tie that all together hopefully and talk about why that matters. I spent some time reflecting on uh, these videos and how I mentioned in the last one that you know it was a little over an hour and I'm like okay well I want to try to figure out how to shorten these things up and I just I'm gonna do the best I can but I don't know that that's gonna be realistic because with what I like to cover, you guys are figuring out, I like to cover subjects thoroughly so that you're not left with a whole bunch of questions. And to do that adequately takes time. So I'm gonna do the best I can to uh, stay on topic and not have too much wasted time in these videos, like this long intro. But um, just so you guys know, going forward, they're probably gonna be longer, <laughs> for better or worse. Uh, and also, some of you guys have said you don't care how long they are and you're happy that they're long, but um, that's not the case for everybody. So, But they are going to be information dense. Uh, so again, that takes time. Um, I think we're going to jump into the screen recording here right away and in an effort to uh, save my editor some trouble. <laughs> I think I'm just going to put myself in the lower right corner and for the most part stay there. Um, so let me get my screen recording fired up here. Three, two, one. Okay, and we're live. So let's start out with our um, slide that we spent a lot of time on in the last video where we talked more about the external ballistics piece of the puzzle, um, how bullets fly in 
how your hit probability is affected by the different factors that contribute to uh, these numbers. And what we kind of skipped over was this line up here where we talked about, or I mentioned terminal sectional density and raw sectional density. Well, what is that? Um, sectional density is basically a, a crude number for the bullet's ability to penetrate. Now, it's way more technical than that, but to, to make it as simple as I can, the sectional density tells you how well the bullet penetrates fluid, let's say, where air is a fluid. It's you know, up to 4% or 5% water vapor, depending on your altitude. Um, tissues of fluid. You know, the... the hard to say 75% water. I, I think I even have a slide here. I looked this stuff up. Um, what does this say? Brain and the heart are composed of 73% water. The lungs are about 83%. Skin is 64. Muscles and kidneys are 79. Even bones are 31% water. So let's say that sectional density is a crude number or score, if you will, for a bullet's ability to penetrate fluid. Well, the problem is that number is incomplete because it doesn't take into the fact into account for the fact that when bullets hit something, if they're not an FMJ, and even if they are an FMJ, when bullets hit something hard, they change shape. And how much they change shape is super relevant. So that's what this terminal sectional density is. I was able to uh, find a graph for that. Let me open this up here. Okay, so terminal sectional density is the recovered bullet weight in grains divided by 7,000. And you take that number and divide it by the recovered diameter squared. What does that mean in English? It means that your sectional density number that's on this other chart drastically gets reduced by a factor of how much is the bullet mushroom, rush, mushrooming and how much is its initial diameter growing and also how much weight is it losing. And both of those numbers are super important. So what I did was I used that formula to figure out these terminal sectional densities and I just went based on um, personal experience but also information I'm able to find online like how much these bullets expand typically to what diameter and how much weight they retain. So I guess it doesn't matter the exact particulars of it too much, but we'll just kind of run through these. So 175 grain interlock, typical expansion performance is like this, where that lead nose, it encourages the bullet to open quickly, but not quite as quickly as something with a plastic tip, which the plastic tip kind of acts like a splitting wedge. These bullets typically expand a two and a half to three times initial diameter and they retain, let's say, about 60% of their weight, depending on impact velocity. So based on that, opening to, say, about triple diameter and retaining 60% of their initial weight, I came up with a terminal sectional density of 0 0.02755. Or to make this simpler, we can eliminate the decimal and the zero and just say, okay, the score is 2,755. And then the 175 ELDX, they perform a little bit differently and their terminal sectional density is a little harder to quantify because you can have typical ELDX performance where the center photo is, uh, let's say, a moderate impact velocity where the bullet stays together for the most part, expands to roughly two and a half times diameter and retains, let's say, 80% of its weight. I think that's probably pretty optimistic. And then this third image is a high velocity impact where we're up to, I'd say, at least triple diameter, maybe more. And you're going to lose some of this weight because this lead isn't bonded and it washes off. And then what's missing from this picture is if the bullet expands at extreme high velocity and the bullet fails completely and completely comes apart and it pukes the lead core out and now you have two separate pieces so your your mass in that equation is divided by two so now you have 
this large diameter of the lead slug and this large diameter of the copper and neither of them have a lot of weight so this uh, number I have on here for terminal sectional density you probably have two pieces that are about half of that number so if we get rid of the decimal and the zero it's 2976 well that's kind of optimistic that's if it stays together and, uh, and expands to triple diameter and retains I think I did like 65 or 70 percent of the weight well if it splits in two and they're both almost triple diameter now you have two pieces that are probably less than half of this number um, so its ability to penetrate is drastically reduced on a higher impact velocity and you get your uh, you know dump all your energy in the animal where the bullets come to a stop they don't exit they oftentimes don't even break the ribs on the far side uh, or exit the far side for sure sometimes they will like on a deer but on an elk it's highly unlikely in most instances you know and I, that's the thing i guess that what i'm getting nitpicked on in the comments is guys are taking everything i say to the bank and to make these videos not 10 hours long a piece i have to speak in generalities so just know that that everything i'm saying like some of this I'm generalizing just to get on with it. Uh, so then we have our CX. Well, what are we getting here? So typical CX performance. Where's my little slide? Where'd it go? Okay, right here. So 95% retained weight. I think uh, I have a slide, another slide where uh, Gavin Gear, Ultimate Reloader, he did a ballistic gel test and with a 150CX and I think he got over 99% weight retention on both projectiles he fired at two different velocities. But anyway, so super high velocity impact. We get a lot of mushrooming, probably double diameter um, and high weight retention. Well, 3400 foot per second impact velocity. If you've seen the weights of these CX bullets, you're not hitting anything going that fast. I mean, my, my elk rifle has potential to hit things going that fast, but I'd have to hit an elk inside of 50 yards to hit it at that kind of velocity. So more realistic arrival velocities are in the 2,700 foot per second to 2,000 foot per second range. And these bullets still retain the high weight, but they only expand to, say, 1.8, maybe 1.5 times diameter. And that lack of expansion and high weight retention keeps this terminal sectional density score very high so if we get rid of the decimal and the zero it's 7722 which is triple the other two bullets meaning that the energy that it arrives with because there's so much less drag because it doesn't have a big pie pan at the front of the bullet it's going to rip through the body cavity at higher velocity and it's going to slow down less so that it reaches the offside of the body cavity at higher velocity and it has less frontal area that it needs to poke through the ribs and the muscle and the hide on the offside which is why they're way more likely to exit so by the time you do all that and you get out the other side of the animal there is some energy that's wasted that goes off along with the bullet into never never land but you got everything you wanted. So you penetrate it all the way through the body, both lungs or whatever you hit on the way through. And then if anybody knows anything about uh, how these systems in your body work, you know, when the bullet blows out the other side, inside your thoracic cavity, there's a vacuum. That's the only way your lungs work. Your lungs don't have any muscle. So the only reason they work is your diaphragm goes up and down and it, and it opens your lungs and allows air to come in well once you puncture that vacuum and you deplete that vacuum the lungs collapse so it doesn't really matter how much tissue lung tissue you tear up if you blow a hole out the other side of the body and it's like a you know silver dollar or even bigger size hole air rushes in and depletes that vacuum and the lungs collapse no matter how much tissue is destroyed so now the thing can't breathe and it's a matter of time before the brain runs out of oxygen and then he's going down. 
So it's not really about like, well, we want to dump all that energy in the body cavity and destroy as much tissue as possible. It's more about like getting that tissue to stop functioning and taking oxygen out of the system. That's how animals fall over is they run out of oxygen to their brain and they tip over. Whether you hit it in the heart or the lungs or wherever you hit it, what's happening is, is it's running out of oxygen in its brain and it passes out. So that's how we get the thing to stop running away. Now, if it's going to run away, we want to have an exit wound because the exit wound is what bleeds. That's where all the blood comes out. It doesn't come out on the entrance, not on an elk. I mean, on a deer it will because a deer is a pretty soft target. But on an elk, when you hit it, you get one squirt on the impact side, and then the muscle closes up and the hide closes up around it. And then he runs like a damn jackrabbit. And if you don't have an exit wound, you got nothing to follow. So um, that's why we want the CX. I mean, that's the quick and dirty of it is that we are willing to waste some energy on the bullet leaving the body as a trade-off. Because life is about trade-offs. We're willing to waste some energy to get a blood trail and to get air rushing into that chest cavity and collapsing those lungs. So he runs out of oxygen and falls over. Uh, and that is going to get him on the ground faster than putting a little more energy into his lungs. But they don't collapse because you haven't depleted that vacuum. And he still has enough oxygen that he can go a long way before he tips over. Um, so that's the long and the short of that. I mean, I, I don't have any professional training on this. This is just the way I understand it. And, and in my brain, at least it makes sense. And in my experience, what I've seen, they go down a lot quicker when you get a hole on the backside and you get those lungs to collapse. Now, again, these are very different things, deer versus elk. So a deer, um, I've seen deer drop and never get up when they're poorly hit. Um, I have, I guess, a personal example I'll give. So a lot of people you know that uh, Roy Weatherby, his velocity or his theory was that velocity kills, speed kills, right? I can say from experience, at least with deer, that is true. So uh, just a little personal story here. So one time I shot a deer, it was a young buck, and I shot it with my 257 Weatherby. I was using uh, 80 grain uh, Barnes. TTSXs going the speed of blue light. I think the I chronoed those and they were going like 3960 at the muzzle. So I shot this deer at like 80 yards and it was quartered really hard away where I was trying to like tuck it in behind the last rib and I was off just slightly and the bullet basically ran right down the side of the rib cage and tore the tore the hide, but it didn't it wasn't close enough to the body that it tore the meat like under the hide it just kind of ripped the hide and then as you guys know that if you've processed even one deer you know that their front shoulders they don't really have a joint it's just the front leg scapula and then muscle and connective tissue that holds it to the outside of the ribs there's no actual joint there so the bullet skimmed across the rib cage and it made contact with that front muscly scapula bone portion of the shoulder and at that distance the impact velocity was probably north of 3900 feet a second little 80 grain bullet right so when that bullet hit now remember i said it stayed on the outside of the ribs so it never entered the chest cavity at all it just hit the front muscly part of the shoulder that amount of hydrokinetic not hydrostatic, hydrokinetic energy going through that muscle at that velocity. You've seen that you guys have seen this before. The feet went completely out from under that deer, hit the ground, one kick of the back leg, dead. Now, we didn't realize that it didn't hit anything important until we hung it up and tried to skin it. So, hang it up and go to skin it, that front right leg completely falls off. There's not even a mark on the ribs. Bullet didn't enter the body cavity, didn't hit anything. Just hit the front shoulder. Killed it right now. So I've seen that kind of stuff on deer. I have not seen that kind of stuff on elk. Um, 
elk story. Okay, so this is going to go in the face of the guys that are like, oh, I want to dump all the energy in the body. And going back to our uh, Dunning-Kruger slide, the uh, look at our wisdom down here. Knowledge plus experience. The I want to dump all the energy in the body cavity crowd, you're up here somewhere because you lack the experience or you haven't shot enough animals or seen enough of these big critters get hit to, to know. But uh, so another example. Okay, we look at our 175 ELDX or our CX or whatever. We're arriving with 3,300 foot-pounds of muzzle energy. A buddy of mine years ago was uh, shot an elk and it was broadside Where's a beautiful elk? Okay, here we go. There he is. That's what we're after. Big, beautiful bull elk, right? Broadside. And he shot it with a bullet that is designed very similar to the ELDX. Lead core, no bonding, um, heavy for caliber, um, not monolithic, right? Elk comes out, doesn't know he's there. He hits it broadside. Right here, mid body, you know, from top to bottom, it was right in the center of the body behind the front shoulder. And this wasn't like, you know, the world's largest elk you've ever seen. It was probably like a three and a half year old bull. It's kind of like a raghorn, right? So he hits this thing broadside 40 yards with a 300 ultra mag that I had loaded these bullets for him. And at the arrival velocity, it was a 200 grain bullet and the muzzle velocity was 3060. So at 40 yards, the arrival energy was 4,000 foot pounds, right? So we're starting here, we're starting at the muzzle at 3,300 with these. You know, and we're talking about shooting an elk at up to 600 yards away and the arrival energy out at 600 is 2,100 foot pounds, 2,200 foot pounds, 2,000 foot pounds, right? My buddy whacks this elk with 4,000 pounds of energy with a lead core bullet. The elk turns around and runs away. Broadside, double lung, with a bullet that's not designed to stay together. I'm going to, spoiler alert, the bullets didn't even scar the, the interior lining on the off side of the ribs. So the bullet went through the front side. I think both, he hit it twice, but I think the first shot hit rib bone, completely exploded. All 4,000 pounds in the energy, er, of energy in the elk. Turns around and runs away like nothing happened. Runs in the woods, runs in the timber, runs downhill another 30 yards, squirts back out into the drainage that my buddy was in. Stands there broadside again, facing the same direction, like nothing happened. My buddy's like, maybe I missed. Pulls up again, lets him have it again. And the second shot hit perfectly at the same elevation, oddly enough, but six inches further back. The two bullets were like this, the bullet, the entrance holes. And then he dropped. So then we come up, we're hooting and hollering, having a good time, blah, blah. But... Um, well, I gutted the deer personally, and the entrance wounds, like I said, six inches apart. That elk took 8,000 foot pounds of energy. The off side of the ribs didn't even have a scratch on it, let alone an exit wound. So, and that's again, not the world's largest elk. You know, normal raghorn bull, 40 yards, 300 ultra mag, 4,000 pounds, center mass. And he just whirled around and ran away like nothing happened. And then three minutes later, he squirted out back into the same creek bed. I think he was, you know, due to lack of oxygen to the brain, he probably wasn't sure what he was doing or where he was. And he was looking for the cows and the calves that he was with that all took off, you know, like jackrabbits. So he comes out and standing there looking around. My buddy hit him again. But the point is, we're talking about, you know, shooting at 600 yards or up to 
with, you know, starting at 3,300 foot-pounds, arriving with as little as 2,200, and you're going to try to tell me that, you know, I want it all the energy in the body cavity because that's going to make him drop dead right now? Bullshit. I've seen it. You know, I gutted the damn thing. 40 yards away, 4,000 pounds, he just ran away with your 4,000 pounds. So I don't want to hear that. It just, you don't know what you're talking about. Um, so what do I want? Well, if you're going to hit him with two, three, four thousand 4,000 pounds, I want something to go out the other side so those lungs collapse, blood squirting out, so when he takes off running like nothing happened, we have something to follow in case he doesn't come back out in the opening. Um, and then you go, okay, well, I'm going to, because I have my high BC, I can be more choosy about where I hit the elk and I can hit him perfectly where I want him or I can hit him right in the heart and I can hit him, you know, whatever, whatever lies you want to tell yourself. I can perfectly place the bullet and everything's going to go right. All the stars are going to align. Well, let's start talking about our hit probability. Let's go back to that. Remember, we spent a lot of time on this and the different factors that go into it. So the reason we want the CX is we view it as insurance. You know, if you're an adult and you do anything important, you don't do it unless you have insurance, no matter what it is. Drive, own a house, life insurance, you name it, on and on. If you're doing something important, you want insurance. Well, that's how we view the CX. That's insurance because despite our best effort to do everything right and all the training we do and all the practice and all of this and that, you guys know, like, if you've hunted any number of times, shit happens. Like, you don't always get the perfect scenario. Um, so now let's talk about the hit probability and how the different factors affect that and what you should be looking for in an optimal situation. So let's go back to our... 160, so we got our 160 CX going 30, 48 feet a second. And we'll start with our novice conditions in the mountains, right? Plus or minus six miles an hour. So a 12 mile an hour window, plus or minus six, plus or minus 15 yards each way. New guy scenario, right? 41.4, 41.3% hit probability. There we go. So this is what it looks like in reality. So this is our. I wish I could zoom this in, guys, but I can't. Um, this is our little 8-inch square, and here's our 1,000 shots simulated, or a 1,000 possible scenarios simulated that give us 41.3%. You know, and I didn't show you guys this before, but you're thinking, okay, 41.3%. That doesn't sound awful, but, you know, maybe that just means that most of the shots just barely went off that 8-inch eight, eight box. Well... Not really. Let's see what we have to do to incorporate all those shots. I played with this a little bit ahead of time, but I think it was something like, um, say, 36 inches wide by 22 inches tall. Yeah. <laughs> so we need a 3-foot wide box by 22 inches tall to catch 99.7% of those scenarios. So that's like... That's probably the, you know, you're going to hit something quasi-important on an elk size. Like 22 inches tall is basically the height of anything important on an elk, like top of the spine to lower part of the brisket. By 36 is like the very back of the lungs, maybe just up into the spine in front of the front shoulder. So that's like kind of worst case scenario. Um at 600 yards again in the novice conditions, 50 foot per second extreme spread, plus or minus 15 yards on the range, um, plus or minus six miles an hour on the wind, blah, blah, three quarter inch rifle, 600 yards. Your real expected impacts, if you do everything perfectly and crack the trigger at the right spot, your impact size is three feet wide by 22 inches tall. Not so good. So we need to do better than that. How do we do better than that? Well, we practice. Um, as we learned in the last video, just making the ammo as good as you possibly can isn't quite enough. And 
using high BC isn't enough and you know any one of these things by itself isn't enough we need to get better so we say all right we're gonna practice a bunch and so now we got a lot of practice under our belt we get to the point where we can read wind plus or minus four miles an hour or within an eight mile an hour window and we we're starting to figure out our range finder and plus or minus 10 yards so what does that get us so I have an eight mile an hour window it means this needs to be 2.67 and our range 6.67 how does that affect it quite a bit better now we're up to 100 percent and our group looks a lot better well what did that shrink that down to let's say it's let's try 26 wide by maybe 18 tall. Pretty good guess, 99.9%. .9%. So now you got some experience under your belt and you are keeping all your shots within an 18 inch tall by 26 inch wide rectangle. Still pretty sloppy. And if we go back to so write that down 26 over 18 if we go back to our 8 by 8 it should match what we have on that other chart 64.5 what was this at? it should be really close 64.7 okay I don't know what what variable I have here that's different but at any rate it's close enough so better but still not adequate and then we say, all right, well, let's say we're going to get really serious about this. We're actually going to put in a lot of practice. We're not going to limit ourselves to factory ammo. We're saying, all right, we want to go all in and make the ammo as good as we can make it and um, practice a bunch and blah, blah. Let's see how much that improves things. So let's say we get, we still have our, three-quarter MOA rifle and our, our, we'll leave our velocity alone for the for a second but let's say we practice a bunch more we'll do this one chapter at a time here so we'll get up to our plus or minus well no we'll leave it where it is we'll leave it at this first so we okay we've got some practice under our belt now we're going to focus on our ammo we're going to start hand loading and let's say we get our extreme spread down to what's unrealistic levels for everybody to achieve. 15 feet a second for five shots. Good luck. So that would be a standard deviation of five, which is about an extreme spread of 15. And we get our five shot precision down to, well, I'll even be optimistic and say three eighths. So shrunk our group size to half of what it was before. Three ace for five shots, so good luck. Where does that get us? 70.1. So now, go back to our chart here, because I can't remember what this was. 64.7%. Sure that down. And we've made the ammo about as good as we can make it. And we got up to 70.1. five and a half percent so you spent God knows how much time and how many resources getting into hand loading buying all the equipment buying good brass good components get this get that and spent a ton of time on trying to get your extreme spread down to 15 feet a second and you're going to shoot consistent three eighths inch groups and you have a moderate level of experience and that helped you about five and a half percent and you've exploited everything you can exploit and here comes the trolls ah no you haven't because you're still using a stupid cx you got to use an eldx and get that high bc or you got to use a burger or what any one of the target bullets all right well let's go over to this and change that to 
our ALDX. And our corrected velocity to make 3,300 foot-pounds was 29.14, I think. Yep, 29.14. Add that in. Drum roll. Okay, 70.1. Here we go. 73.2. Three point one percent. So, based on what we talked about with the terminal performance already, you're trading ability to penetrate, ability to blast through bone and whatever else for three point one percent hit probability. No thanks. All right, now you go. All right, well I'm gonna spend a ton of more time on training and resources and get really good at this. Which is the best thing you should do. Alright, so let's get our... I mean, you need good equipment and, you know, all this ammo stuff helps, but practice is the key. And a gun that allows you to practice and that is consistent enough that you're getting good feedback. So, we got... Let's look at our... Uh, our I would call it our proficient conditions where not an expert yet, but you're good. And you have a four mile an hour window and you know the range within plus or minus five yards. So I think that would be half of this. It would be 1.33 on the wind standard deviation. And our distance, when I say 10 yards, so that'd be half of that as well. 98 and a half. Now we're talking. That's what we want to see. But that's, you know, a lot of that's got to be because we picked the ELDX, right? Well, let's go back to the CX. 304. 160 grains. 3048 on the velocity. Get that back in here. 97 and a half. Hmm. All that BC, you gain 1% at 600. Like I said in the last video, you get closer, it's even less. <sighs> Just for giggles here, not that I'm promoting this, let's say, okay, well, you go into this as a novice and you think, I have all this ballistic capability, I can shoot farther than 600 yards. Now I got everything dialed in, I'm all trained up, squared away. I'm gonna shoot at a thousand yards. Fifty-one. Ick. How big is that group in reality? So 600 you are driving tax, you know, can't miss. Same size target. 1,000 yards. Looks like we're back up around that three feet number. Damn near. 34 and probably 19 anyway. Yeah, so we even lost one there. So now you're driving tax at 600, you go out to 1,000, your group is. 34 inches wide and 19 inches tall. You comfortable with that? I'm not. The stupid stuff you see on the internet. Oh, 1,200 yards. Now it's even worse. What is that? Four feet wide? By. 22 inches. That's not even enough. 51 inches wide. Almost. <laughs> 53 by 24. Does that get them all? There we go. Well, just about. 99.9% .9 hit probability, but your 
Group size is 53 inches wide and two feet tall. That's uh, like from here to here and from there to there. It could be anywhere in between there. And this is you know what you're doing. That's not very encouraging. So let's stop talking about doing stupid things. All right, let's come back to 600. Get back to our eight by eight box. So this is you exploiting the ammo as much as you can. You getting practiced up. Or in reality, you know, not everybody's going to have the resources and the time to do that. So we'll uh, come back to more of an average Joe scenario of wind reading ability and bullet or uh, ammo performance. So let's say we're halfway in between here. The proficient level and the, you know, you got some experience level. Or we'll do plus or minus three. So that gives us what, a six mile an hour window, and we'll assume you took the time to figure out your range finder, and that will give you the benefit of the doubt and say that you're plus or minus two and a half yards. So you got the range nailed down, and you're okay at reading wind. So that would be for our range, that would be 1.67 standard deviation. And our wind reading ability would be two. Then we'll go back to our three quarter MOA rifle and our factory ammo 50 foot per second extreme spread. 84.4%. I think a lot of people could live with that. What does that mean in actual, like how big are is it for all your impacts? With, uh, it's gonna be more than 12, let's say 15 inches wide and about a foot tall. Almost. 16 inches wide. 99.8, <clears throat> we'll call that close enough. So now we have a foot tall, 17 inch wide impact zone with nearly 100% hit probability. You're a decent wind reader. You're using factory ammo with a three quarter MOA rifle. You spent some time to practice. You got the range nailed. Um, everything else you got squared away, temperature, pressure, all that stuff. Um, humidity, you're still off, because like I said in the last video, people aren't that great at determining that. And all your shots are landing in a 12 inch tall by 17 inch wide rectangle. And now we'll, we'll say we give you the benefit of the doubt and you get your velocity a little bit better. Let's say you get lucky with the factory ammo or you did take the time to hand load. You got a little bit better extreme spread, but you're still struggling to get it under three quarter MOA precision. So we'll say even uh, 30 foot a second extreme spread. So now our group's a little shorter. About 10 inches. Okay, so 10 by 17. And it's kind of oval shape. You know, I don't have the ability to put an oval in here, I don't believe. Um, well, maybe I do. No, I don't. Well, height 10, radius. No, it won't let me. Okay. So you can see our impacts are kind of an oval shape. Why is that relevant? Well, let's start talking about how they're going to land on the elk and where we want them to land. So we have, what's the slide I want to use? Oh, this one. Okay. So we have Mr. Elk here. I can find it. There we go. Mr. Elk. And this is a little bit elongated left to right, but it makes the point. This is what our shots are going to look like in reality. Now that we're all practiced up, we're pretty good wind readers, but you know we're not perfect. This is what the real impacts are going to look like, your real hit probability. 
So why is this relevant? Friggin' camera overheated again. All right, so getting back to this, we have Mr. Elk here. Then we have, this is where our bullets are actually gonna land in reality. Why is this relevant? Well, because we don't get to pick exactly where the bullet's gonna land, we don't get to pick what it's going to encounter. Look at this. Here's our, I apologize, this is kind of grainy. I couldn't find anything higher resolution, but we have our elk skeleton. You know, and our theoretical oval is kind of overlaying this area. You go, well, okay, I know I'm shooting an ELDX, and I know it's not designed to penetrate through heavy bone, and I'm going to shoot it back in the ribs. Well, like I said, shit happens. You don't get to pick where the bullet goes. So what if it hits the scapula or hits this heavy joint? I mean, this bone is like concrete. That's not going to end very well. So that's what I was talking about when I say, you know, with the CX, we look at it as insurance where... It doesn't matter where it hits on here. You know, it doesn't matter where it hits on this oval. It doesn't matter if what's underneath that is bone or the spine or what it's going through. So that's why the CX. Again, I'm, I'm beating this horse to death because I don't want to have to keep talking about this as we go through the series. Um, and then the other thing is, okay, so we look at our little drawing here and I have a box drawn around this. Well what is this? This is our ideal impact location if we can get it. Not necessarily the heart which a lot of people think oh, I want to shoot it in the heart. Well that can be kind of like a shot of adrenaline to the animal sometimes um, where it doesn't necessarily have the effect that you would think it would. So we want the bullet to end up here if we can help it. Why? Well this area contains something called the autonomic plexus. So it's basically an area, it's kind of like, think of it as like the breaker box on your house. Um, this is where all the nerves come off the spine and off the spinal cord and go down into the internal organs and tell them how to function and what to do. This is also where the uh, windpipe or trachea of the animal comes down and attaches to the lungs. So it's like right where it goes from windpipe to lung, right at that key attachment point. As you'll notice, this is also where the scapula thins out and attaches to the front leg. So if you can put a bullet here, you know, I'm sure you guys have watched videos online where, you know, kill shots on animals, whether it's online or home movies or whatever. Then you see an animal get hit and the second the bullet hits, the ass end drops and hits the ground first, and then the front, the front end drops and the, the animal's head slams off the ground. Well, usually when that happens, that's where they got hit, is you put a bullet there into all those nerve endings, or even a little bit higher and hit the spinal cord, everything stops. It's like the proverbial light switch, where in my experience, and you'll see it Two, like when animals get hit back in the lungs, they run like a damn jackrabbit. And you gotta hope they, the bullet exits so you get a blood trail and they fall down soon and on and on. But you pull it, put a bullet up in here, he's going down in a hurry. So that's our ideal location. As far as ideal circumstances, you know, I, I talk more about elk just because they're, they're harder to kill. Um, I, as I gave you my example earlier, like I've killed deer with some poor shots and some, you know, situations where I never thought it would kill the deer and it did. Because uh, like I said, I mean, I can shoot, but, you know, shit happens. You don't get to pick all the circumstances of your hunt. Um, so if we look at an elk, when's the ideal time to shoot him? So we have this picture. Here's your picturesque, you know, broadside elk. This is what we all think of we're going to get someday. Like, this is what we want, broadside shots, right? Gives us the most room for error. Well, when he's like this, this is him alert and ready to move. So we don't want to shoot him when he looks like that, if we get a choice. This is, you know, if, if he's facing you, that's kind of, or facing away from you, that's kind of worst case scenario. 
If he's quartering, that's worst case, worst case, or a worst case scenario than this. We're assuming broadside, okay? So if he's broadside, for broadside, this is the worst case because he's basically ready to haul ass. This is him alert. He knows what's going on, and he could take a step at any time. So that's kind of worst case scenario. What would be better? Well, if he is feeding. Because in this scenario, he's not paying attention. And he's probably going to be there for a little while. And worst case scenario, if he hears something he doesn't like, he's going to lift his head and look around and try to locate it first. So this gives us the most amount of time to get the bullet down the road before he's going to move. Because they, they will sometimes meander a little bit with their head down while they're feeding. But they usually don't take off into a sprint <laughs> from the feeding position. So this would be our uh, second best scenario. Third best scenario, if you can get it, would be what we already showed you, where this is essentially the elk at full bugle. And sometimes they will bugle when they're walking, but if they've planted their feet and they're posturing and they decide they're going to cut loose, and you're, you know, you're ready to break the trigger and you're trying to decide when, if he stops and it looks like he's getting ready to bugle, send it down the road. Why is that? Well, because he's going to stand still for at least a few seconds and allow the bullet to get there. But also, when he does this and he's in this position, he is giving you more forgiveness left to right because if you start getting this direction up toward the neck, I showed in our other um, picture. Forgive me, guys. I got so many slides here. I'm trying to go back and forth. You're hitting him in the spine. You know, if you start getting up here into the neck while he's at full bugle and his head's down, I mean, this image, his head's a little bit higher than that last one I showed you, but you get the point. Like, you hit him in the spine, he's dropping instantly, and he's probably going to be dead before he hits the ground. So, um, and if it goes far back this way, again, at least you're still getting a double lung. If you're using a CX, it's likely to exit again. Speaking in generalities, it's likely to exit. And if he runs, you're going to have something to follow. Um, best case scenario, I didn't uh, get a picture of that. But best case scenario would be like if he's bedded. You know, bedded broadside where you still have this same type of presentation. People have different opinions on whether or not you should shoot a bedded animal. I would say if you're taking a shot that's a little outside of your comfort zone, something you probably shouldn't be doing anyway, um, try to make that happen on a bedded animal so you know that he's not going anywhere. And if your first shot isn't perfect, you probably got time to get a second one on the way before he gets to his feet. So broadside bedded would be ideal, but um, people have different opinions on that, and that's not... Uh, uh, always available you know a lot of times these things are on their feet up moving around so you know normally if we think like this red box would be our perfect place to put a bullet that's under ideal conditions you know where you are getting it right in that shoulder joint and you're taking away his wheels and you're going into that autonomic plexus and you're just he's in trouble right now where if you have a little bit of wind uncertainty you're better off cheating that up a little bit like I showed in the other picture, so that you get your wind forgiveness here and you're still hitting something important. The other thing to keep in mind, too, is that the diaphragm is kind of shaped at an angle here. So the lower you go in the chest, the less room you have this direction before you get into the guts. So you're better off going a little bit higher and you know avoiding that, that hard shot. I mean, I've hard shot animals before. And it rarely has the effect that you would think. You'd think they're going to drop instantly and they're just dead, right? Well, that, that's usually not what happens. Um, so we're looking at this from a, like I said, an insurance standpoint. We're looking for forgiveness because everything doesn't always go the way you want it to. You know, like I said, shit happens. I mean, you just, you have to look at this from a, things aren't going to go the textbook way you think they're going to go. You know, something's going to go wrong. So you want to put yourself in a position where 
you can likely retrieve the animal if the bullet doesn't hit exactly where you want it. Or, you know, maybe the animal turns slightly one way or the other and you have to go through more more uh, mass and more animal than you thought you were going to before you hit anything important. You want that deep penetration. And like we already saw from the numbers, um, the hit probability you get by going up to an ELDX, it doesn't mean anything. No, I mean, not at the distances we're shooting. And I showed even at uh, farther ranges. It doesn't, you know, it, it's not some free pass to just shoot animals at a thousand yards. Like it, it doesn't help you as much as you think it does. Uh, range is the most important, then wind, then everything else. You know, then all the stuff that everybody likes to talk about. BC and group size and extreme spread and all that. Like, yeah, that stuff matters as we saw from playing with the numbers here, but it doesn't matter nearly as much as getting your range right and getting your wind right. You know, you can hit stuff with any bullet if you get the wind right and the range right. So hopefully this video has helped shed some light on, uh, well, further shed light on why we are choosing the CX over anything else. Um, there's a lot of stuff that goes into this and we're looking at it from a, you know, again, from an insurance standpoint and just trying to put in our, put ourselves in a position where if something doesn't go exactly the way we hope it does, uh, we still are delivering a premium bullet that's going to penetrate deep and hopefully expand. And at the end of the day, the, what, you know, what the internet tells you about how the high BC and the this and the that is what you need. It doesn't make that big a difference. You know, if you're shooting, again, if you're shooting super long ranges, it matters a little bit more, but at the ranges we're, we're talking, it's a lot more important to have a bullet that's going to do, do the job and then get good equipment, get a good rifle, get, you know, consistent ammo or load your own, get a system, work the bugs out of it, and then get out there and practice. So I think that's all I have for this one. Um, I, I know this was another long video, but... Thank you guys for uh, sticking it out. I think next we're going to get into um, talking about the loads and um, what powders we're going to use for each of the cartridges and go into that more of that Gordon's reloading tool and show you how that works and uh, why we landed on what we landed on. I think we're also going to talk about um, barrel length, why we chose the barrel lengths we did, and I want to talk a little bit about the uh, short barrel craze and what that, <laughs> why that... Uh, uh, why that is popular I'll never understand but we'll talk about how that affects things and how it can affect what powders you should use and velocity and all that and we'll go into that and then hopefully after that um, uh, load development video we'll be at a point weather wise where we can get out and uh, start making some racket with these guns so thank you guys uh, like subscribe share with your friends all that good stuff and uh, we'll see you on the next one